Hello. Oh, here we are. Hi, everyone. We are going live for a virtual container gardening workshop. Welcome. Hey, everybody. How are you this morning? We are in the greenhouse at Mun Botanical Garden. Uh, my name is Sarah Crocker. I'm the co-chair of the St. John's Food Policy Council. And I am here today with Tim Walsh, who is the nursery manager for the culturalist. And we have a short but action-packed container gardening workshop for you today. We'd like to cover some basics of edible plants, how to care for them, and um, yeah, we can also answer questions at the end. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, this event is part of the City of St. John, St. John's Day, so thank you for supporting this activity. And it really ties into what the Food Policy Council is all about, um, trying to make productive links between different people in the food system so we can support local action um, to the benefit of all. So thanks for joining us. Um, we're going to record today's session. It'll be available on our website, through social media, as well as uh, repost on the city website. So if you couldn't join us uh, today, first day of summer, <laughs> June 20th, um, right. we hope that this information will be helpful um, in the future. We are also going to be giving away the container that we make today. So if you haven't had a chance, please sign up to the St. John's Food Policy Council mailing list and we'll do an email draw once the event is over. So without further ado, I think that's everything I wanted to welcome and introduce to you today. As you have comments, we'll take them and try to answer them as we go along and at the end. But I'd like to turn it over to Tim. Thank you, Sarah. I can see there's somebody here from Dallas already. Maybe not able to enter into the contest, probably. <laughs> that's right. We're going to deliver it locally in St. John. Yeah. <laughs> that is one of the restrictions. That's great. And from Grand Bank as well. So uh, welcome, everybody, into the nursery. I'm so happy to to have uh, all of you into my space today on this first day of summer. Exciting times. Uh, there's so much happening now in the nursery. And, and in all nurseries around, I was out at some of our local nurseries, and uh, they're just booming. There's such an interest in, in gardening this year. It's wonderful. You know, at the start of the pandemic, we're all unsure as to how that will go. Uh, I spoke to several nursery people who weren't sure if they'd even grow a lot of stock because they weren't sure how people were going to be able to access that stock during the year. But it's the complete opposite now. What's happened is that they're selling out. And I know what's happening, of course, is that you're all having an opportunity to spend time in your gardens and get to those things that you may not have ordinarily had time to do before in the past. So I've always said the pandemic has, has kind of taken away a lot from us, but it's also given us something as well. And I think that's one of the, the main things, hey, Sarah, that's given us. It's the ability to kind of regroup and to I like take the away. idea that we can take something that's so hands-on and try to connect with you all virtually. Yeah. Yeah, so let's get into it. So container gardening. Um, container gardening is huge. Um, and on top of that, vegetable gardening is huge. Another thing that's happening a lot with the pandemic is that we're all wanting to grow more food. And I think that's fantastic. Um, but not everybody has that option. Not everybody has um, a large space that they can actually grow food in. And so we thought it would be a nice idea to give everybody the opportunity to grow food. And the best way to do that is by growing it just a container. And that container can be just simply on your back step, on your front step, basically wherever the sunniest spot is. We'll talk a little bit about that as we get into it. But first, let's talk about the container. Mm -hmm. So the plants don't really care. The plants don't really care what they're growing. As long as they have what they need, they're, they're going to grow. They're going to do what they, what they like to do. And if we make that container the right size, if we use the right soil, um, then that's going to happen. It doesn't matter what color it is. It doesn't matter. Uh, what shape it is, but it doesn't matter what size it is, and it sometimes matter what that what that container is made from. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we like to go with uh, clay pots, for instance, and I've got a clay pot here, and clay is fantastic, mm -hmm. very traditional, yeah. very beautiful. Definitely um, the Mediterranean garden. Yeah, it's, it's that real, it's that real sense, isn't it? The one thing about clay is that automatically it's heavy, and so we're going to be using a plastic pot today. And if you look at the two, they're also Except for the fact that this one's a little bit bigger, which is important because you want to have a nice volume of soil in here in order to grow a lot of plants. Um, this is much heavier than this. 
and sometimes these decorative ones are good, like as decorative. Like you could put a plastic pot inside of the clay exactly. one. Exactly. Yes. Instead of trying to grow it right in there. And that's a good point because one of the negative sides to growing in clay is that clay is porous. And because of that, you lose moisture through the sides of the pot. Mm -hmm. And so it's fine when you, when we plant this up today, there's not going to be a huge moisture drop on the soil because the plants are small and the root system is small. But when we get into midsummer and late summer, when these plants are up here and this root ball is completely filled, then we're going to really need to maximize the amount of water holding capacity that that mm -hmm. soil has. And we don't want to be losing it through the clay pot. So if you're going to go with clay, as Sarah said, maybe insert the plastic pot inside so you still have that decorative effect. Mm -hmm. And you still have that kind of patina that you get on the, on the clay pot, which is very attractive. Or go bigger with the clay pot because you're going to lose that moisture. So let's put that aside because today we're actually going to use this, this terracotta looking plastic pot. It's got some very important drainage holes on the bottom. Mm -hmm. This one, I'm not sure you can see it at home, but there's actually little ridges on the bottom there. They show the very bottom. Yeah, those little ridges there. Those are very important because what that does is when the pot is sitting on the ta on the, your deck or on your patio, it's not sealing off those water holes. So otherwise, those holes would be sitting right on a flat surface, and any excess moisture that's trying to get out of this pot will not be able to get out. And then what's going to happen is you're going to get really waterlogged soil, and then you, the, the plants are going to suffer as a result of that. So we've got our drainage holes, we've got our nice pot. It's a good size. We want it to be a good size because we're going to be ex expecting a lot from these plants. I'm going to be putting in, Sarah and I talked about it before, I'm not quite sure how many I'm going to be putting in yet, but there's at least going to be seven, maybe eight, maybe ten plants. I've got a lot to choose from here. It's really nice being in the garden and having this like array of plants. Um, behind me there's like so many different kinds of herbs, flowers, vegetable plants. Um, you know, you definitely want to make it look nice and full and have like a, a really attractive planter, but you also have to think that they are going to grow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and you don't want to you don't want to put too much competition in there, but you want you also want to maximize on um, what you're trying to grow. So we've got a good size here. You can go bigger if you want. It's up to you. Depends on what you're going to grow. And now we're going to put in our soil. So soil is the the container is important. The everything's important. But I will say that the soil is probably the most important. If we if we don't put the right soil in here, then how can we expect to get good results from the plants that we're putting in there? We'd be doing the plants an injustice, and I guess ourselves in terms of our time loss and that sort of thing, and our effort, by going to all the trouble, finding the nice pot, buying all the plants or growing them, and then putting it in a crack of soil. Mm -hmm. um, we really need to, and I, and I love this saying, we need to be loyal to our soil. We really have to make sure that the soil that we're going in here is is a workhorse. It's mm -hmm. going to be able to do exactly what we want it to do. And what we want it to do is we want it to hold on to moisture, and we want to have air spaces in there so that excess moisture can get out of there. Mm -hmm. And it has to have good structure, and that moisture ability to hold on to moisture is going to be also how it holds on to its food. because the, the, the plants will actually obviously need food in order to in order to grow well. So, what so we use we're not putting just like any any soil like from your garden into this pot. It's going to be a soil that's more tailored for a container Absolutely. gardening product. Like, yeah. Um, and then we've also we're thinking as well with edible food. You know, you are what you eat, so it has to have like a lot of nutritious food for the plants, and then that'll go into the thing that you want to eat. Yeah. Absolutely. And so the soil that we're using is one of the industry standards. It's commonly called ProMix. Well, that's a brand, is ProMix, but it's commonly uh, referred to as soilless mix because it doesn't have a mineral soil in there. It is primarily peat. And so maybe about 85 to 90 percent peat. And then the other little white flecks that you may have just seen when, mm -hmm. when Sarah showed you the up close, that's, that's perlite, and perlite is a mineral. And that mineral is in there because that's what's going to give the drainage. If you had nothing but peat in there, if, if you think about our peat bogs, then uh, then the peat would hold on to way too much moisture. Mm -hmm. And so the perlite actually helps to expel some of that excess moisture. So we're going to put that in here. The other option that you can also have too, because as Sarah said, we are growing some, uh, some nutritious food in here, and so we want to be loyal to our soil. You might actually want to add some compost. And so, We've got some wonderful compost here that we make in the botanical garden. It's been this particular batch right here has been screened, so it looks very wonderful, very 
uh, very good. I'm sure the plants will really enjoy uh, growing in that. And you can you can sort of augment some of that per, uh, pro mix with uh, some some of the uh, uh, some of this compost in order to build up that extra bit of nutrition that you'll get from the natural components of the compost pile. Is there uh, such a thing as too much compost to put in a container? There like is. This? There absolutely is. Yeah. yeah, you put too much compost in there. Um, and so what will happen is just it'll start to interfere with that structure, that structure of the soil. Because compost by itself is a soil amendment, but it's not a full growing medium for your plants. So it will benefit from uh, the nutrition from there. It'll benefit from some of the organic matter in there as well. Uh, but it's not really balanced enough in terms of the soil structure to get everything we need out. So we can add probably about 20% of the compost into the soil mix. So I've already added some of that into the pro mix earlier. So we're good to go. So I'm going to throw in our soil here. Well, that's a pretty big scoop. Like how, oh, like yeah. roughly what size pot is this? Oh my goodness. Well, as you can see, it's probably about, uh, what, uh, 15, 16 inches wide at the top. I'm not, I'm not sure if you heard that, but our, our heater just cut in. And Sarah and I are being washed in a, in a bath of nice warm air coming down here. It's a little bit cool outside today. Yeah. One of the advantages of having a virtual gardening workshop and being in the greenhouse is that we're not too weather dependent uh, to be able to do this activity. But that being said, um, we'll definitely speak a bit about how to take care of these plants um, given the weather. And tonight, um, it's looking like the forecast is going to go down pretty low. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And a lot of other people may be a little bit concerned about some of those tender plants that are out there tonight. But if they've been out there for a few days, they're certainly hard enough. So here we go. Now you can see I've actually filled up that pot. Like right up to the right top. up near the surface. In the end, this is where I want it to be. Because when it comes to filling up your pots, you want to have a little reservoir at the top that's going to hold water when you're watering. Otherwise, if I was to fill this pot up to right up like this, when I pour water in there, a lot of that water would spill out onto the ground. We really want that water down into the into the pot. We're actually watering the roots, we're not watering the uh, the leaves mm -hmm. or the stems of the plant. So I know what you, what's going to happen, of course, is that as I plant, I'm going to be displacing a lot of the, the soil. So some of that soil is actually going to start to come out as we go. And that's fine, but because we really want to start with that because that's going to be our finish, our finish soil level. So I've, I'm actually going to put it down. I, I don't know if you noticed me, but I was actually with my fingers kind of pressing that soil down. What I want to do is remove some of that airspace that's there as a result of me filling it. But I don't want to pack it down really hard because we really want to make sure that the roots are able to easily move through the soil. Uh, if we pack it down really hard, also we'll compress the soil and the water won't flow through it properly. But we also don't want it to settle after we water it. So I like to try and get rid of some of that airspace just by pressing it down a little bit. You can also take the pot, put it on the floor, and you probably can't see this, but I'm just dropping it. You can hear it. I'm dropping it a few times, and that helps to settle that soil right down to the bottom of the pot. Okay. So there's my pots ready. Cool. So what are we going to put in it? So, so much to choose. <laughs> um, so what 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 you would think about is first of all, what do you want to grow? And today we're going to concentrate on food, so you can think about that and maybe do your own list. But also, the first thing you want to think about is where's it going to go. So it's going to go outside, obviously. It's going to go on your patio. It's going to go on your deck, front or back, somewhere in your garden. But how will you be viewing it? So are you viewing it? Uh, are you going to put it in a corner, or are you going to be having it in an area where you can walk around it? And that determines then what you plant and how you plant it. So I'm going to plant this as if we can see all around. And so that now means that the tallest thing goes in the middle, right. and then we we sort of grade down to the sides. So then the tall things and then the medium things will go around that, and then the lower things and the things that want to spill yeah, down the sides will go around the side. Side. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's food. Sure. We got to put a tomato in. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I got one here. This one's not going in, but this will give you an example of one of the probably one of the best container uh, plants for uh, tomato plants around. This is a variety called Tiny Tim. And it's a little cherry tomato. And actually, we've got a couple here, Sarah. And you get right. to eat one. So These this is about as big as I get. They're little this tiny is it. cherry tomatoes. This is it. Now, it, for your viewers there, you probably may or may not see it, but these are already in bloom. Lots of blooms there. And this is the type it'll produce. And it'll produce trusses of you know, 8, 10, 12 mm -hmm. of these all in a cluster. 
It's a determinate tomato, which means that it's not going to grow like a vine. It'll kind of stay like, like, a, like a small cluster or a shrub. And it'll have multi-branches. And you can sort of see little branches coming out in there. Because some and of the other... do you need a support for this, like don't. a tomato cage? No. You don't. Yeah, that's the beauty of this for a container. Mm. Uh, I so I think that's first. always a good... A good thing is if you're looking for certain varieties to plant in your container gardening, looking for something that says tiny, toy, baby, like yeah. those are all sort of different words that gardeners use to describe the type of variety and the growth habit that it'll have. Yeah. The, the beefsteak, for instance, is a wonderful tomato, uh, mm. but it's a very tall, indeterminate type that grows maybe five feet tall, and mm -hmm. that would be an option here. If we wanted to grow a tall one, we'd have to put in staking, and then it would need a... Oh, that was good, eh? That tomato. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we're not so we're not going to put that one in, but we are going to put this one in, which is the same thing. So here's our here's our tiny Tim. So probably like within you know a month maybe. Like are you thinking by July? Oh, yeah. It'll be making tomatoes. Yeah. So this one was was planted only June the eighth. Okay. So it's got to hear some things. So that's okay. not and it that does long. have some little tiny flowers just starting in the center there. Exactly. Just starting in here. So there's our tomato. You see the nice roots. Uh, the beauty about tomatoes, too, and this we're not going to do too much with this one, but that they'll root on the stem. So if you've got a really leggy tomato that you've been growing indoors, uh, you can actually bury that stem a bit, and that helps to give it some strength in the pot, and it'll start to root on the stem. So I'm going to just literally just with my hand. I'm actually going to take some of this out already. And I may, may make a little mess here, but that's okay, because this is a workspace. And there it goes, right in the center just like that. Mm -hmm. Bring the soil around and press it in a little bit just to firm it in place. And there's our tomato, ready to go. Now I've got some other plants here that I'm going to start jumping in there. This is a basil. Mm -hmm. So again, think about what you're growing and why you're growing it. Are you growing it? You're not going to feed your family with this. Um, what you're thinking about more is, is accenting your, your, uh, your kitchen and the foods that you're making in your kitchen. So you want to have things like like basil. And this basil is a little bit older, as you can see, well rooted. I've actually eaten the top of this already, so I pinched it, and now what's happened is that we've got these side branches happening. You want to maybe yeah, sure. show that a little bit closer? Yeah, so that's a term you hear about in how to harvest your plants, is if you pinch them, you have these little sort of nodes on the side, and new plants come out, and then you can, once this gets larger, pinch the center, and then two more. So then you get a nice bushy habit which is kind of what you're going for with exactly. basil. Yeah. And just even these side shoots here. Yeah, they'll all start to grow and you And this is okay. It's that's uh, a little bit that's a little bit root balance. Yeah. We're going to loosen that up a little oh, bit. Okay. So I'm just I'm just breaking I'm just fanning out the base of that. And then when that gets into the soil, it'll encourage those roots to shoot out. Yeah. Basil will sometimes when especially when we start to get warm uh, air, it'll start to go to flower. Mm. And that's kind of it's starting to finish off then and that's fine. Um, I've got another thing to show you in a second. So I'm just moving some soil aside. I'm going to press that basil into there, bring the soil around, and it's that easy. Right now the basil and the tomato are the same size. <laughs> That's obviously not going to stay that way. But the thing is, we know that the basil has a short uh, lifespan in the garden. It just does. By its very nature, it's an annual plant. It grows very quickly. Um, but I've also started some new ones. Yeah. So these are just brand new basil brand new plants. Brand new basil plants. Same ones. And so what will happen is that by the time this one is all harvested and ready to come out, these will be a bit taller, and then we'll just plunk those out and pop them in, and we're ready to go. So it's nice so to have that That's a little technique, plant. yeah, a succession technique to keep, you know, something looking fresh, keeping, um, always having something ready in the garden. Now, we've got some beautiful lettuce here. Yeah. These are lettuces that were started from seed wow. uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, actually, May 19th. These okay. ones were started. Look at that. So this is a romaine type. Yep. Green lettuce. And romaine, I always think of as being a really large, you know, humongous plant. But in a container, would you treat it differently? Yeah. This one? In a container, well, the container will kind of, uh, kind of cause it to stay a little bit smaller, anyways. Mm. But uh, when I'm growing uh, vegetables in containers, especially lettuce, I harvest them all the time. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to wait till it gets to a full size like you see in the grocery store and you get that full head. I'm actually going to be going out and pinching off these, just eating the outside leaves okay. and just eating them as I need them. Uh, so we're treating it a little bit different. So this is a six pack here. I'm just going to with my, my trusty butter knife here. Very technical, Very technical. Uh, professional yes. level of tools. Um, <laughs> but just goes to show there's a lot of things you may already have on hand that you can use in your gardening. Proceed. 
So there's our lettuce plant in a nice little cube. That's simply just going to be pushed in there. And look at that, that one's done. Now, depending on how many you have, you may not necessarily have this many plants at home. You might have a little six pack. Mm -hmm. But again, because we're a botanical garden and we're trying to show as much variety as we can here today, I'm going to put a couple of different lettuces with a couple of different foliage colors because the other thing about this container is we want it to look good because you're going to be seeing it and you want to be able to, you know, if you're if it's just outside your kitchen window to be able to look out at that and, and really feel good about it, just just seeing it. And so I'm going to put in this red variety. I'm going to come to the other side for that and just pop that in there. In the same way, you can just keep picking the outside leaves yes. and it'll just keep growing back from the center. Yep. Yeah. Where, whereas the basil, you took out the center exactly. and started with that. Exactly. So every yeah. plant kind of has its own special growth habits and might be a bit of trial and error when you're first learning yourself. But, you know, it's a tasty mistake if you harvest too much basil. <laughs> That's right, yes. Rosemary. Mm. Absolutely beautiful. Too bad we don't have smell of vision here and you can actually, yeah. you can actually get that wonderful, wonderful scent. Rosemary, by its very nature, is a shrub. It's actually, a, you know, something you'd see over in over in uh, the Mediterranean, and it actually grows quite large. And you can see, uh, Sarah, you can see how woody that that stem is already. So this is, an, yeah, an example of like a woody perennial sort of herb rather than an annual herb. Yeah, exactly. This plant can actually come back inside in the autumn and grow it as a house plant. Uh, this one I grew from a cutting. So uh, this is. This I grew from the cutting here in the greenhouse, and it's been in this pot for a little bit. It's got right. lots of roots there, uh, but we're gonna and these roots are a little bit more because it's a more of a shrub. It's a little bit more more uh, aggressive root system. But again, I don't know if you can hear those roots tearing, but don't worry, it's it's uh, it's gonna benefit from it because if we left it just like that square pot, it would take a long time for the plant to even recognize that it's out of that pot, and it wouldn't benefit from the uh, the soil around it. So fanning out, so I'm going to fan out those roots when I sit it down. It's going to encourage those roots to spread out to this pot. So move that soil aside, press that in, and there's our base plant. I mean, we could almost stop there, but I'm not going to. There's more to go in here yet. And when you planted all of these, you've basically taken a little bit of the potting soil and brought it just over the level. That's it. Yeah, um, I'm not burying the stem, except for like we talked about the tomato, you can probably bury that a little bit if, if it's a, a leggy plant. You just want the top the same level as the soil. Yeah, the exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we don't want to bury. Most of these plants don't like their stems to be buried because it interferes with, uh, uh, well, and what happens is that the soil actually comes in and starts to deteriorate the stem. Okay. And then when the stem deteriorates, of course, it interferes with the flow of moisture and nutrients from the root system up into the foliage. And then, of course, the plant will often die as a result of that. So we've got more room for more things. I I'm think. definitely just thinking about some color well, too. Well, we're going to get to that. Yeah. Color is all going to be on the outside. Okay. Because the middle. yeah, because this is all going to fill in the foliage in the middle. Um, we can put a pepper in. So we've got some okay. lovely peppers here. This is actually a jalapeno. Oh really? Yeah, a little jalapeno hot, mm -hmm. and it's a little eventually going to be a little red hot mm. jalapeno. That would be nice. So there's a lot of information on a nursery tag. So if you're going out, um, you know, if you're buying some plants that are already started, if they, if it's a great supplier, they'll probably have individual tags, and it gives you some idea of what you might expect from that plant. So it tells you what type of plant it's a pepper, the variety name, that it needs full sun, yeah, full sun, um, some ideas about how deep to plant it, and then some more information on the back about, you know, what kind of soil it likes and its preferred sort of uh, water. Yeah, and if you bring that up a little closer, you'll see a flower. Oh, great. There's a little one. Don't want to knock flower it off. There. Ooh. Yeah, there it is, that little white bud. Yeah, and, and so that back. flower will get fertilized and that will be your pepper. So beautiful, healthy little plant. Um, I've got an example here of a banana pepper that I've been growing for yeah. some time. And you can <laughs> see that plant is fairly large. That's a bigger plant, but you can see the banana pepper is actually forming on there. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, so they're, they're quite substantial plants. So let's pop this one in nice and easy. No real root bound here. So we're just going to open up a little pocket and poke that in there. So that's going to get up to about here. The tomato is going to be up to here. The basil is going to be up and down because we're going to be eating it. And of course the rosemary, the rosemary when it's time to harvest it, you're just going to come out and, and just pinch that off and bring that in and eat it. So that'll think in the same sort of thing that will encourage that branch. And a little bit of rosemary can go a long way as well. Oh yeah. So 
you know, you could also, when you're bringing them inside, you could also maybe at the end of the season sort of trim down your rosemary to have a lot of fresh green growth and, and dry it for later as well. Yeah. Also, when I was talking about the basil starts earlier, I forgot to mention that I also start some new lettuce. Mm -hmm. So we've also, we've already planted the lettuce, but I've got some lettuce started as well. So that way, when these lettuces are near the end and starting to look like, oh, well, we've eaten a lot of them and they're not really recovering, because that's kind of what happens, then we've got some new lettuces to put in there. So it's important to kind of think about that succession of planting. So let's put in parsley. Mm. Nice little flat leaf parsley. I'm just getting rid of some of the yellowing leaves here, which is normal. Um, and parsley is, of course, a very popular flavor for the kitchen. This one's been in here for a little bit. Again, yeah. there's those roots. We're going to just loosen those up. We're not completely removing them. That's all we need to do. And maybe we'll put this one. We have to try and find a space. Yeah, we'll Getting try and find cool. a space. It seems like a lot, but you know, it's it's going to produce a lot, and, and we want to maximize as much as we can here. So make a pocket for that. There we go. Already lots to look at. Already and yeah, it looks nice looking down the top yeah, too. You can exactly. see the pattern, like that circle yeah. kind of forming now. So now let's look at some color. Or let's look at, well, we're going to do a couple of things because I have a, I have a creeping time. I have mm -hmm. a time plan. And we got to put time in because it's such an important and commonly used uh, kitchen herb. And the other nice thing about time is that it does cascade a little bit. Mm -hmm. So we'll plant this on the edge and that will allow that time to kind of spill down on the side and it won't interfere with any of these uh, these other plants here. This is a fairly small-ish plant. And sometimes even if you got a big plug like that and you don't have a lot of room, you can actually just take away some of the soil. The time is much more slow growing, it is. I guess, overall. And it yeah. just sort of fill and, in any little space. And we can even just put that right here and let it spill down underneath the lettuce, just right there. See how there's always a little pocket for something? So there it is. You can fit them all in there. And now, as we talked about earlier, we do want this to be also attractive. So let's put in a couple of uh, flowering plants. So we've got some marigolds here. Marigolds are a favorite. Um, they are even somewhat edible. So okay. the marigold petals can be used, especially to uh, to decorate salads. And uh, and so there's a one little marigold flower right here. Right. And we've got lots of branching happening right here. It's a little bit tall just because it was grown in this tray with a bunch of others. But that will start to branch out, so we can. And now, actually, would you would you try and um, deadhead or pinch back this marigold? Yeah. So as this, well, it's got lots of branching right now. It's just the flower is shooting up above this, the most of the foliage. But there is, it's, again, it's difficult to see. And even if Sarah brought this closer to you, it would be difficult to see on the uh, on the screen. But there's like four branches that I can see here. They're going to grow and then all start to produce their own buds and then eventually flowers. So we're just going to put shed in about halfway between the center and the outside, because that's an upright plant. Mm -hmm. And why stop at just one? Let's pop another one here. And marigolds, like, they have a lot of other things. Like, you could eat the petals, but they're also considered, like, a nice companion plant. Exactly. As well. Yes. Yeah, because they've got a really strong um, aroma from the foliage. It can often be a repellent for some insect pests, like mm -hmm. aphids and things. So that's a couple of marigolds. And the rest, of course, you can put in your garden. The other plant that's actually very commonly used as an edible flower I must is... Say, this is a yeah, personal yeah. favorite of mine. If you don't know them already, I definitely would encourage you. Yeah, so this is a pansy or a violet. Um, and this particular one is a little miniature one called Johnny Jump Up. Mm -hmm. And the petals or the flowers are, are actually edible. And, um, you know, they're not... They're not going to uh, give you huge amounts of nutrition into your diet, but it's just that kind of a thing that you throw in on the top of a salad or something to really give your uh, your dish that that wonderful visual appeal. So he's a little bit floppy right now, but right. that's okay. So we're just going to put that here right at the edge because this plant is going to spill down over the side in time. So it's going to start to flower. We we'll have this big kind of cascade of those beautiful flowers, and you just come out and pinch them off uh, when you're ready to eat them. And that keeps it blooming longer, right? If you exactly. take those off and keep eating it, keep harvesting, um, then the plant just has a signal to make more flowers. I'm going to put another one in. Let's see what we can do. Maybe over here. 
and you can really you can see I'm just kind of seems like I'm forcing it in there, but the soil is so soft and and pliable right now that you can just kind of easily insert them in there. And so again, because we're um, because we're um, also going to be looking at this, doesn't always have to be nothing but edible plants. So we can actually just put some other flowering plants in there. Just be mindful of the fact that you know that some of these are not edible. So again, to get that kind of cascading effect, because we're going to have a lot of height with the tomatoes and with the basils and with the peppers, that we really want to get some color down over the sides. And probably one of the loveliest uh, plants for that is, is trailing lobelia. And so here we've got the little lobelia plants. Beautiful. This particular one set nice little blue and white. Yeah. Uh, you can bring that up a little closer. So this is the lobelia, and you're being pretty like aggressively just like cutting right through yeah, the I roots because it's all grown into one big pack. Yeah, because there's you've got one plant there. Yes. I've actually got. I'll show you. There's actually two more plants here. Mm -hmm. So, and it sounds like I'm. I am. I'm. A, I'm aggressive, but I'm also tender. So I. Firm. I yeah, firm. There you go. So, so there it is. I mean, here we've got two plants. We've got three plants in that one little corner of our pot. Right. These plants are going to grow. They're going to thrive. They're going to be quite large plants by midsummer. Mm -hmm. And so we'll just, because now they've only got a small little root ball, we can just so easily insert that near the edge. Yeah, go ahead and pop one in there. And see how easy that is. And maybe we'll even come around and do kind of a triangle of these so that we've got right. them nice all the way around the edge. And just bring the soil over. Look at that. How many so plants now are it's getting full. Right? Now it's pretty full. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> I think I might stop. There's only one other plant that I'm going to put in there, just because it's again one of those wonderful edible flowers, and that's nasturtium. Mm -hmm. Nasturtium had, had, has probably got the most interesting edible flower because right. the flower has got that beautiful peppery uh, flavor, and and it is one that you will really notice when you eat. It's got that real nice, uh, real nice. Uh, zip to it when you when you bite into that. And um, that whole plant is edible too. Like if you yes. were really brave and uh, you could definitely use the leaves, they add that like it's almost like a horseradish kind of heat. Yeah. So right. you can use the flowers when they're in bloom. And I've even heard of making nasturtium seed capers. Right. You can exactly. Yes. The little seed heads. Yes, that's right. Because the seeds very much look like capers, and I've got some seeds here. Yeah. Let's see. So. These are what the dried seed would look like. Could you still start these from? Oh seed? yes, yeah. I'm so actually, this is something you could still start. Yeah. So so I've got some already started from pots here. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just going to try and pop this one out. It's a little early, but oh there you go. There's lots of nice roots there. So I'm going to very carefully because that's a fairly uh, tender stem right there now. I'm just going to pop this down into that slot. But if you didn't, you would just simply just take this little seed. I'm actually going to poke it in there and just poke it down just a couple of times to hide the seed. Yeah, luck. there you go. One more for good luck. Just poke it down enough just to bury the seed, and we're ready to go. So, Sarah, I think I'm going to stop there. I think that might be enough. <laughs> uh, but as you can see, quite a lot of plants in there. Uh, let's see if we can count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 14, 15 plants okay. in this little in this little container. So 15 plants, and it is a large container, but given the amount of volume we're expecting here, how are we going to keep this healthy and looking good all season? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to give it some water. Okay. It's obviously going to need water. We've just, we've just disturbed this plant. We've just, you saw me kind of tear those, well, uh, gently, firmly. firmly, but gently take apart those plants. Uh, and so now they're going to need uh, some recovery. So obviously they're going to need water. So when I water this, and I'm not going to be able to water it to its capacity here now because we'll make quite a mess on the table. When I water this, you, you saw the depth of some of those roots, especially the tomatoes and some of the other bigger plants. They're about halfway down. We have to make sure that that's where the water goes. So it's not just watering the foliage and the surface. It's watering that whole mass. And I like for that first watering, to water until I see a little dribble of water coming out of the bottom of the pot. Okay. That tells me that all of this soil is wet, so that now those roots are going to go in all directions to find that moisture. They're not just going to grow off. And so we would water it pretty heavy, um, and I'm not worried too much about, uh, about the foliage, because we're not watering foliage here, and I would go all the way around, especially making sure I get those 
some more shallowly rooted plants around the edge. I'll sometimes even take off the end of my watering can here and I would put it forth very gently in and around the edge to make sure that I get all those. So if we're putting these plants outdoors, um, you know, I think watering is like a big question people have for their container gardens. How do you know it's watered enough or dried out? Sometimes when they dry out, they're hard to even get any water. Exactly. So the, 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 probably the best message there is to never let them dry out. Yeah. Really, they should. You know, if you think about it, the plants, if the plants, if the surface of the soil and if the soil is dried out, well, then the inner uh, structure of the plant is, is, is in, it's kind of in, in repair at that point. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's kind of starting to shut down because it doesn't have the moisture that it needs to hydrate those leaves. So really, if you think about it, then the plants are starting to get <clears throat> dehydrated. And when they get dehydrated, there we go. Uh, when they get dehydrated, of course, then the cell structure starts to break down. That's not good for the plant. So the, uh, that's the beauty of the soil, for starters, because this soil has got such a great water holding capacity uh, that it holds that water for such a long time. But it's not indefinite. Right. Uh, and especially, you know, right now, today, this is staying in the greenhouse today because it's cold out there. Uh, but next week, this could go outside. Um, and when it's outside, of course, it's, at, it's subject to the heat of the sun. As the plants get bigger and the roots get uh, get larger and start to fill out that pot, then um, all those leaves are going to be needing moisture, and so really the soil is going to be working over time in order to provide that uh, moisture for these plants. So we just need to make sure that it's uh, that it's well hydrated. And so the general rule of thumb is water it well first. The next time you're not going to water it until you see the surface just starting to dry up. Now, if you're not sure, you can put your finger and do the poke test and poke it down into the surface. And if you pull out your finger and it's wet, just a few, just a knuckle down, yeah. then you know that all the rest of that is wet because it's going to dry near the surface first, and then that dryness is going to make its way down to the bottom of the pot. Uh, the other thing you can do, uh, especially in the early days, is lift the pot. Right. So it's going to be heavy. It's not as heavy as it's going to be when I finish watering, but when I finish watering this pot, when I lift that, it's going to be pretty heavy. Uh, and also, the other thing that happens is the surface of the soil starts to change color. So right now, it's this nice dark, rich color. Um, as the soil starts to dry, it actually starts to turn a lighter color. Mm -hmm. uh, so keep it well, away Well, soil is such an important question. And I saw a few people on the, um, on the comments of our workshop just asking where to find soil and, and what is ProMix. Uh, ProMix is kind of a brand name for soil. Um, but basically, you'd be looking for something that is called potting mix, um, and that would generally be a more sterile soil. Um, it should be weed-free. Um, a lot of compost mixes aren't, aren't sold that way. Uh, but a potting mix will have a lot of peat moss in it, as we explained, and vermiculite or perlite, which helps with the soil structure. Yeah. And just it, it's kind of something that you have to kind of uh, experiment a little bit with. Because what you have to be careful with is not all soils are created equal. So it is about finding a brand that works well and sticking to that brand. And asking people and you know other gardeners and other growers. Um, houseplant soil, you can sometimes get uh, containers that say houseplant uh, soil mix. That may or may not be good for this because a houseplant has different requirements than, than these plants right. that are going to be growing out, outdoors. I find houseplant soil doesn't have enough drainage in them generally. And if you put a, if you put, if you fill this with a bag of houseplant soil, uh, and you put it outside, we do have a lot of rains that the soil can sometimes get really waterlogged, and so when that happens, of course, then we, we have a, a problem with the root structure of the plants. So the other thing that we have to be mindful of as well is we've got, of course, we've done all this work now. We've got this beautiful container. We've got all of our wonderful soil in there, um, and we've got all these beautiful plants that we've spent a lot of time and more money to get up to this mm -hmm. point. Um, but they will not live on just water. Right. It's important that we feed them. We are now expecting a lot from the soil. We want to get tomatoes. We want to get basil. We want to get flowers on our marigolds and on our pansies. And we want to get uh, we want to get those nasturtiums growing. And they, they, there's nothing in that's the one thing about about bought soils is that they're usually sterile mm -hmm. in terms of nutrition. So we have to put that in there. Right. right. And we can put that in there in a couple of different ways. We talked earlier about how we could actually add compost to the, to the soils, and the compost will actually add some of that nutrition. 
And that's wonderful. And that works incredibly well outside in a garden bed because you've got the huge volume of soil and the, the roots and the plants can go in all directions to kind of look for that food. Uh, in a container is very finite. And it's all, as it's, as its very name, it's contained. It's contained within this pot right here. And so we have to ensure that these plants are going to get everything they need from this limited volume of soil. <clears throat> the only really reliable way of doing that is through some fertilizers. Um, and so there's a couple of different ways you can do it. You can actually add fertilizer to the soil beforehand so that you can actually get container gardening fertilizer. Right. And it's a slow release fertilizer that you mix in with the soil. And it's actually all throughout the soil before you plant. So then when, the, when you plant and you water, when you water, it starts to dissolve that fertilizer and the plants then start absorbing that fertilizer. And so that, if that's in the soil that you're buying, it'll definitely say on it yes. what type of fertilizer it is and slow release fast yep. or you know the kinds of nutrients. Exactly. You sometimes see it if you get, um, even if you got bought a, a, a nursery grown plant for your garden, you sometimes see little circles, little beads in the soil, and that's what that is. Mm -hmm. It's a little uh, coated bead of fertilizer that the coating slowly breaks down and slowly releases that fertilizer. And sometimes they can feed uh, a container up to three months, so they just slowly right. release that. And that's why you could get such a big looking flower and such a small. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's all about food. You know, the plants really need food. I mean, probably sometimes it's the one thing that we forget a lot about because we think that they're getting it from the soil because that's kind of how all nature gets it from the soil around. But this really isn't natural. I mean, it, it's kind of hearkening towards nature because it's plants, but, but we've created an unnatural state here for these plants. You would never have this many plants kind of growing together in nature, and you certainly wouldn't have this many varieties of different plants all growing together. Mm -hmm. So again, we are expecting a lot from this, and we can get it, yeah. but we just have to make sure that we, we give the plants what they need. So fertilizer. Uh, this is a water-soluble fertilizer. This one is called plant starter fertilizer. And it's got those three numbers, and those are the, the macronutrients in the soil that plants mm -hmm. look for, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And they're in all fertilizers, and they have to be. By law, those numbers have to represent what's supposed to be in here. They can't just put those numbers on there because they want to sell a product. Uh, so this has 10% nitrogen, it has 52% phosphorus, and 10% potassium. And what they do is the nitrogen is what's going to give the plants green growth. So that's what's going to help them produce nice leaves. And so we've got some basil in here, we've got some rosemary, those are all leaves, and that's going to really benefit that. But this one is a starter fertilizer because it's got high phosphorus, 52%. And what phosphorus does is that it encourages roots and flowers. And what we've done, of course, we've just disturbed all those roots. We've, you saw me slice them with a knife and, and, and tear them apart, and now they're in here. So this 52% transplant fertilizer is really going to target those roots and actually get those roots repairing and growing out into that soil. And then the phosphorus, 10%. Phosphorus is often uh, very common in soil naturally anyway, so that's usually at a lower rate. It's usually balanced with the nitrogen. Um, and so the phosphorus is good for overall disease resistance and plant health. So that's our transplant fertilizer. So if you really want to do a good feeding on this, give it that one application of transplant fertilizer, and that's enough. Because when we water that, it's going right to here. We're not going to water it again until it gets dry on the surface. And that's going to be for this plant. It could plant or it could be even, even a couple of weeks before we need to actually water this again. Mm -hmm. uh, and by that time, that repair will have started. That Those plants would have absorbed that, that high phosphorus. They will be starting that repair. And then you can look to then balancing out that fertilizer then throughout the season. If you've put the time-release fertilizer in there already, which it's already in here, mm -hmm. it's called NutriCoat. It's 14, 14, 14, so it's even proportions of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, then those that fertilizer will feed this pot for, for months. Mm -hmm. But if you notice that, or if that's not in there, or if it's in there and you still notice that your plants look a little bit yellow and maybe they're, they're looking like they're not growing the way you want, then you could think about then adjusting to another liquid feed but a more balanced one. And the most common one is 20, 20, 20. And you hear us horticulturists talking about that all the time. And that's an even proportions of NPK. And, uh, and that usually provides that balanced food uh, for these plants to do well. So thinking about the fertilizer piece, it does sound a little more technical. There's different nutrients. There's the timing. There's yeah. the balance there. Um, what's 
you know, you mentioned 2020, would that be just like a general all-purpose one? Is, if you were just going to buy one, that one is, kind of fertilizer, yeah. just go with that. That is a general purpose fertilizer. You can also, if you, if you're, if you're unsure, you can actually go to your local nursery and buy vegetable fertilizer. Mm. It's already done for you. It's got that balance of that general balance of NPK that ve generally vegetables like. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's another option as well. But 2020, 20 is that middle of the road. It's going to give you, uh, it's going to give you good results, assuming you have the right pot size, mm -hmm. assuming you have the right soil and assuming you have the plant placed in the right place. Right. And so maybe that's where we'll go next and talk about yeah. placement for this thing. So <clears throat> again, we've done a lot of work. We've maybe spent some money. We've, we've grown all these plants. We bought them. Uh, now we're going to place them. We're not actually going to put it outside today. That's our, that's our first thing that we're, we're going to say right now. And it's a kind of a good lesson because just because you do it today, doesn't mean that it's ready to go outside. Um, today it's cold. Uh, it's going to get warm on Sunday and Monday. Next week, it's a, the forecast is, a, is looking like the, you know, the, the spring is broken and we're actually moving into, uh, into, into good weather. If you believe the long range forecast. Um, but you're going to keep an eye to that because that's important because these plants are all indoors. Now they've been grown in a, in a cool greenhouse. They haven't actually been in this greenhouse. This greenhouse is quite warm. Sarah and I are only in here today to demonstrate. Uh, but these have been grown in an unheated greenhouse. So they are hardened off and ready to go outside. Uh, but we're still only going to put them out when the conditions are, are much better. We, and that's really, I think we're thinking about particularly the basil, which is considered a really tender plant. Um, and the tomatoes too, to a degree, yeah. they'd all prefer a little more warmth. Yeah, absolutely. And so we talked about uh, when we were started to plant this, this container is going to be viewed from all sides. So we're going to find a place outside of our, and again, close to the house, preferably because then you can zip out and harvest some basil and harvest some rosemary when you're in the middle of a recipe in, in the kitchen. Um, and we're going to find the sunniest spot, the sunniest spot possible. And I know that none of us are blessed with, um, with, with sun all the time. We have gardens that have sun in the morning and shade in the afternoon, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Uh, the beauty of this container, while it's getting a little bit heavier now, um, it's still movable. And so we can move that around to find the best place. You can even put it out in your garden and lay it somewhere and keep an eye on it throughout the day and kind of see how the sun tracks over this Would plant. Would you move your plants during the day? Well, that, that, that becomes impractical, as, yeah. especially as the plants get bigger. But just in terms of right now, uh, having an eye to how the sun tracks on your property. So where do you get the the longest and warmest blast of sun uh, in your on your property? So that could be in some people for some people that's the front of the house. For some people that's the back of the house. It's very property specific. I can't say this is a front door patio planter. It's not. It's a sunny planter, and right. it's got to find sun. Uh, not and to say you that. also want to be able to see it every day so you can check on the water, exactly. harvest your herbs. Exactly. And appreciate the beauty of it. And we put some flowering plants in here to make this attractive. So we want to be able to place this somewhere uh, where we get the best, uh, the best bang for that buck. So we want to be able to easy access, um, also easy viewing, and, uh, and of course, the, but the bottom line is that it needs sun. Mm -hmm. So if you can get it at least six hours of sun a day, okay. that would be great. Um, and that's full direct sun. That's full direct sun, yes. Six hours. Yeah. Um, and if it's got dappled shade after that, that's okay. And even though we'll get reflective light off some of the surfaces after that, but those six hours will be fantastic. You will get incredible results uh, with six hours of warm sun uh, with this container, with this pot, with this soil, with this food. Yeah, I could see it working really well if you had a back step and a little, you know, sunny day patio chair yeah. set out, reading your book. Eating your beautiful salad. You painted a good picture. <laughs> so now we just need it to be sunny. Um, so thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I saw a few comments coming up in the video as we were talking, and one of them was just a little more question about watering. There's different types of plants in here. Basil might want different water than nasturtiums. How do you, like, what's some advice on that? Yeah, it's fine. Uh, they will, what will happen is that when we start to get competition in here, the plants that need the most moisture, they'll start absorbing more of that moisture. Uh, but for the most part, these all these plants that we've got in here, they will all grow perfectly well in here. Yeah. So if they're well watered, well fed, they'll be able to take what they need to grow well. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. The other thing to be mindful of is we talked about sun, but the other thing is wind. 
Mm. And it is a little bit windy around here. Yeah. Um, and especially when these plants are young, uh, you want, maybe want to uh, kind of keep them out of the, the, the really strong winds for having to have any. Um, and the other thing about wind, of course, is that it does suck the moisture out of things. Because wind blowing over even the leaves of those plants will start to pull moisture out of the, the foliage. And then how they, they replace it, of course, is by drinking it up through the root system. Uh, so just be mindful of that. And as the plants get bigger, maybe you might want to stake a couple of plants that get a little bit taller. Like if, if our pepper plant gets tall like this one we hear, and we're out in a windy spot. Yeah, have a windy deck. Right, so it may be just a matter of putting like a little stick in here, a little bamboo, and just tying some string around it just to keep that plant upright. Mm -hmm. uh, but they won't all need that. You know, the rosemary is very sturdy, and, and the pansies are, and even the lettuces are not going to get tall. And but just for some like of those this, they're growing plants. with each other too, they so are. the sturdier marigolds can kind of They'll support help each other. The right? Yeah, there. yeah, absolutely. They'll compete, but they'll also support. So uh, that's a good, uh, it's a good balance going on here. Thanks so much, Tim. Um, we're really excited we could bring this workshop to you. Um, it's really exciting to see everyone's questions, and we probably didn't quite get to them all, but I'd encourage you to come by and visit the Botanical Garden. Um, of course, there's many ornamental plants, but there is a raised uh, garden bed as well. And now, um, just yesterday, the garden is open on... Yeah, we open, we're open Wednesday to Sunday yeah. uh, from 10 in the morning till 4 in the evening. Uh, so, and the garden is beautiful and uh, there's a wonderful vegetable garden and we did a Facebook live session if anybody's interested in that. That's on our Facebook site all about vegetable gardening in raised beds. So uh, uh, if you're going to move, ready to move from the container into the ground, uh, it's a good resource there. But we'd love to see you come by and visit the garden. It's absolutely spectacular right now. And there's always incredible information on the Botanical Garden website, too, around choice vegetables for this area that can do really well. Um, and we're all on social media these days, so definitely encourage you to check out other Facebook Lives and the Twitter feeds, everything. So um, on behalf of the St. John's Food Policy Council, thank you for tuning in. Thanks so much for Tim for being our guest speaker. It's been my pleasure. It's so nice to be able to talk to all of you out there and uh, tell you a little bit more about, uh, about growing. Remember, be loyal to your soil. <laughs> And hope you all enjoy your St. John's Days. Thanks again to the City of St. John's for helping us make this happen. Have a great day, everyone.